Good evening. Welcome back. It's great to see everybody. It's great to be here with you. Uh, I am Minister Lee. This is Pastor Mike. And welcome again to our midweek Bible study. Uh, we want to welcome anybody who may be here for the first time or anybody who's just logging in. Again, it has been a real treat these last five, six weeks, something like that. I think we're on six. Something like that, yeah. right? It's been a little while. So whatever it's been, we really appreciate you guys continually uh, signing in, logging in, watching, interacting. Honestly, it, it, it makes it so much more uh, enjoyable for us. Um, so here's the deal. As in every other week, what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to take this opportunity right now and to just share this link. Okay, so if you can just, whether you're watching on Facebook, whether you're watching on our website, you can just share this link, this link excuse me, uh, and put it out to your friends. Maybe there's somebody that you want to tag, or maybe you just want to put it out there generally so people can see what you do and what your church is about. Okay, but this would be a great time to do that. So if you can do that, and if you can, uh, if you can do that, just hit that little share button and make that happen as well. We want to encourage you to, to be engaged. So if yeah. there's if there's questions that you have, uh, and you know, and some feedback even. So uh, we have started a new format about two weeks ago, uh, where we took questions and we put them towards the end, so that way we can we can give all the time that's necessary to those questions. And so the first question I'm going to have for you guys is, how do you like the new format? Is that something that you like? Do you like having the questions at the end, or would you rather have them more uh, more in real time? Uh, that's number one. Number two. Um, if you have questions, if you have anything that you want to say uh, regarding questions, we'll hold those off to the end. But any observations that you might have throughout uh, the night as we, as we go through the scripture, please type them in. Our moderators are there. Uh, if you are on Facebook, our moderator is Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Good and to if, see you, Lisa. And if you're on um, the website, our moderator is Athena. So, Athena, uh, hope the kids are sleeping. So... <laughs> But uh, here, here's what we want to do tonight. So, uh, as always, like I said, interact, be engaged, uh, bring out whatever you want. Let's 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 have fun and let's do it together. Okay. Um, any other housekeeping things that we really need to say? I don't. Oh, I know what we have to do. Guess. Yes. yes. So if you are a first time guest, if this is your first time logging in, uh, maybe somebody shared this link and uh, and they put your name on it. Maybe you're nosy. Maybe uh, you cut the cord a couple weeks too early and there's nothing else to watch. I don't know why you're here, but we're happy you're here. So whatever that is, if you can please put a number one in the comment section and let us know. And please put your name there as well. I know sometimes on some of these sites we have really cool uh, kind of monikers and stuff. But we really like to just, uh, just you, you know, reach out to you personally. So if this is your first time, put a number one there. Uh, Kingdom Life Family, if you see somebody, welcome them the way that we know how. Uh, and with that, we're just going to keep moving right ahead. So uh, we're going to review. So Pastor Mike, we did, um, last week we started a yeah. new series. So yeah, I was very excited. Um, so for those of you just tuning in for the first time, uh, I like to just kind of put a plug in there from the beginning of the year. We started teaching yep. people how to read your Bible. Um, it's not enough to let somebody else read it for you. Get into it. Find out what God's Word says. But with that being said, we started a new series last week called Small Books, Big Message. And uh, the point of it is that we recognize that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the hope we have uh, of God's love for us, uh, his redemption for us. What that means is how God takes us when we're at our lowest and he brings us back into relationship with him. No matter what we've done, he forgives our sins. He calls us back. And that whole process um, from original sin in Genesis goes all the way through uh, to the culmination in Revelations. But what we find is that uh, really often there's these little books that some people that have been Christians their whole lives have never even read, uh, which is funny because it only takes about three minutes to read the entire exactly. book of Philemon. It takes no, longer to learn how to pronounce it. It takes longer. Yeah, there you go. Um, but yet, there's so much. And you know, Minister Lee, you said something, and it really got me. Before you're like, you made the observation. You said, you know, sometimes we think of these little books as ah, they're just these little mm. books. So you just overlook them. But you realized that there was so much packed right. into such a small book. And that's really what this is all about, is these small books of the Bible that you may have never heard of, like Philemon, uh, or next week's 
All right, I Let's broke it. it. We're going to Jude next week. Hey, Jude. Uh, hey, Jude. Um, or, or Titus. And some of these small books, how much is packed into these? And so that's what we're uh, excited about uh, talking about. And so last week we opened uh, Philemon and we said it was written, obviously, by, uh, by, the, by Paul. That's right. And uh, Minister Lee, why don't you take in from here? So as we, as we found, we did the first seven verses. And so again, we just want to encourage you, uh, please go back, check that out. You know, yeah. uh, that's, st that's still available. It's available on YouTube. That's available uh, on Facebook. So you can go back, you can check that out and that'll help you to catch up um, on, the, on what we're going to talk about today. But again, so we started with Paul. Paul yeah. is, is one of the apostles. Paul is, you may have know, you may know him more as St. Paul, depending on your background or even geography. St. Paul is in Minnesota or, you know, different places like that. But Paul writes this from prison, okay? And he's in prison because, really because he's preaching. Correct. Right? So, so the, the government at the time looked at that more almost as um, heretical. They looked at it yeah. as, you know, as, um, what is the word I'm thinking? Almost treasonous. Well, we, it would have been treasonous because at the time, uh, Romans citizens were to, and all of the people were to bow, they were to treat Caesar as God. That's right. And you worshiped, uh, you worshiped Caesar. Um, so that's why the, the Romans, ironically, had such a big issue with the Jews, mm. um, because the Jews would not worship Caesar. But they also, the Romans, recognized that their, their, uh, their kingdom was spread far and wide, so they were interested in keeping the peace. So as long as everybody was peaceful, if you didn't worship Caesar, but you paid your taxes, hey, you were fine. But there was this problem because then this small sect of people called the, the Christians came up. And, it, and, and the Christians, there's a couple of things. They wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't worship Caesar, which Rome was kind of, for, for, for some of the, 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 the Caesars, they were, they were, it was okay. They weren't going to be a problem. But... The Jews had such an issue and they were causing such a disruption uh, that the Romans had to act. Mm. And so you'll find that Paul's um, imprisonments came because the Jews, <laughs> who ironically were the chosen people of God to begin with, were so offended by the message of the gospel that Paul and the apostles were bringing. Mm. And so this is how we find Paul in this place of being in jail. And I love how he says this. He says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother. So Paul's writing this. Um, and so the first thing we, we can see right from the get-go of this book, um, an interesting observation. So I would encourage you at some point, just over the next maybe two or three days, Look through, uh, Paul wrote 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. And I would encourage you to go through and look at the first two sentences of every one of his books, because you're gonna find that Philemon starts differently than all the rest of them. Minister Lee, did you figure out what it was? We talked about so this. So what's, what's interesting is that this is the first, this is the first, well, and only, mm -hmm. uh, letter or, or, or text that Paul writes where he doesn't uh, set himself apart as an apostle. It's not how yeah. he defines himself. And so we had talked about, you know, so what is the, wh why is that important? Yeah. And I think one of the things is is that you have to remember when he's writing, he's writing to church leaders of churches right. that he's already kind of planted and people that he's overseeing. And so there's a different authority if Bob from, you know, if Bob writes to you as opposed to senior vice president, Mr. Bob writes to you. And for whatever reason, and we, as we as we go through today, I think it'll be evident. Yeah. You see that Paul takes the more personal approach, right. the more relational approach. Paul doesn't have to come in and say, "Hey, listen, I'm Paul. I'm in charge." Let's. This is way different and completely intentional. But I think it goes back to even what you had said earlier. When you have such a small text, right? Everything, what's left out and what's in. Every word, every placement, it all means something. And that's what's so exciting about, you know, this. And so this goes back to the, the whole the whole principle that we've mm -hmm. been learning from the beginning of the year, which is the inductive Bible study approach, right? right? Looking and making the observations. And I think that's a good point. It's sometimes the observation is not what you see, but what you don't see. That's good. Right? And so just like you said, he doesn't come in asserting himself as I am the apostle, Paul the apostle, or Paul the servant of Jesus Christ and apostle, right? Because in all of the books where he puts that first, he's giving instructions right. to the church. But you see, right from the beginning, 
that this is a personal letter to an individual. Um, so, so that kind of starts setting the context of it and it becomes important where we go a little bit further. Uh, but what was next, what we decided? So, Paul, obviously, in any letter, mm. you're writing to someone, right? And so Paul is writing to Philemon. Yeah. And the thing about Philemon that is very interesting is that he, here's what we know, and, and we touched on this last week, but this is just to catch up. Here's what we know. We know that he is a church leader in Colossae, okay? Which is where, uh, if, if, if you're familiar with the Bible, you've heard of the book Colossians, and that, that was a letter that Paul wrote to that church. Uh, so so he, he is that. What we also know about Philemon, what sets him apart, and this is very interesting, right? What sets him apart to his boss, yeah. to, to the big guy, is that he understands love yes. and he has faith. And we, we took a little while to, to even develop that, this idea that there were four different kinds of loves, and we settled on the fact that when we talk about biblical love, we talk about an agape love, yes. a love that is first serving before right. it's seeking to be served. Which means now, Philemon is known to be a selfless person, yes. a generous person, a giving person. And then on top of that, Paul highlights his faith. And the thing with biblical faith, when we use, uh, when we use faith biblically, it's not how I believe. It's not a mental thing. It's more of a physical thing. Yeah. I know what you believe because I've seen your actions. Um, and so these are, these are the words that Paul himself is using to describe this guy. So I think one of the, one of the first things that, that gets really interesting is a lot of these Bible stories that we, we kind of read when we're kids, well, well, who's the good guy? Who's the right. bad guy? Who do I root for? But we've read this and there's two good guys. Paul is, we know who Paul is. Paul's yeah. great. And from what we know about this man, Philemon, he's incredible too. So yeah. really, really interesting. So I think that's the interesting thing. And what I love about what we said was, and what we see here is, you know, when we talked about the agape love, right? We recognize that agape love or divine love, or as you said, biblical love, in this sense, it was a giving love, not a receiving that's love. Right. So everything about what, so Paul is identifying that with Philemon, Philemon, everything I hear about you is you are selflessly giving to others. You are putting the believers, you're putting the brothers, the saints, the Christians around you first, and you're doing it with extravagant generosity, mm -hmm. right? And, and here's the interesting thing, because we see that Paul says the result of it is he's refreshing, so both it brings joy to Paul as he hears that Philemon is refreshing uh, the hearts mm -hmm. of the saints. That's and great. so that's the setup. So we have this setup where Paul's a, a prisoner, um, but he's not worried about, you know, um, um, he's not complaining. He's not saying, I'm a prisoner, woe is me. He's saying, I'm a prisoner for the gospel. I am choosing my chains, mm. right? I am, I like I'm writing I like from you. I'm redeeming this time that I'm in prison. I'm choosing my chains for Jesus Christ's sake. And at the same time, I want to let you know, Philemon, these amazing things I'm hearing about you, how proud I am. I also want to say he writes this as a brother, but he also uses the word partner, a mm. partner in ministry. And so that's going to become very important in where we go. He's writing as a brother and he's writing as a partner in the faith, a partner in ministry. Um, because we think, right, what do we normally think? We think of Paul. He's the head of all these churches. Right. He wrote all these books. So maybe he would talk on brother level with Peter and John, right. but wait a minute, who's this Philemon? And he's elevating Philemon to his level as a partner and a brother. So very interesting for where we go. So what I love for us to do is get right into the next part of our scripture, because last week we focused on verses one through seven. What I'd love for us to do is just go ahead. So I'm gonna read uh, for us here from a verse Eight. So Philemon, verse 8 through verse 22. So if you have your Bible, uh, follow along with us. I'm reading from the NIV 84 version, um, but uh, go ahead. It says this. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold in order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man, now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I'm sending him, he who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to have keep kept, I would 
I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel, but I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor that you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done anything wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hands. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Oh, and one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Let's pray before we go into this. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. God, forgive us for the times that we've approached it as a merely a discipline or a chore, and we've not come to you asking uh, to hear your life-giving words to us. I ask your Holy Spirit would reveal the text to us, reveal Paul's heart to us, reveal your heart to us, even as we discuss tonight, that, Lord, it would bring health and life to our bones as your word promises, joy to our hearts. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, I think before we even get into the text, some background is probably necessary. Yeah. So we just met a third character, right? So Paul is writing to Philemon on behalf of Onesimus, right? So who is Onesimus? Onesimus seems to be a slave. Yes. Right? Now, for whatever reason, Onesimus is obviously not with uh, Philemon at this point. Now, Pastor Mike, my first question, my first place of of, uh, of understanding is when I say slave, when I see the yeah. word slave, it has a, a there's an Americanized meaning that, sure. that, that I'm, you know, a contemporary, you know, antebellum, I, I think of when I think of slavery. Is is that the kind of slave we're talking about? Are we talking about Onesimus may have been, you know, raided from another land, brought over here and made to do stuff he didn't want to do? Um, it could have been okay. Um, that was it, that, that certainly existed, but very often slaves were just the lowest uh, uh, sense of the society. It could have been mm -hmm. uh, somebody who owed a great debt, um, okay. and so then they were sold off to pay the debt to somebody. Um, there was actually those that were born into slavery, so their parents were slaves. The children were then property of the slave owner. So there was a whole host of different ways they could have come uh, in, in, into the slavery. Um, there are some differences uh, from the antebellum you know, issues, that the way we think of it. Um, there was a sense that slaves did have a little bit more sense of right. Um, there's, they weren't, while they weren't free, uh, they could go and uh, do business on their owner's behalf, um, but they were very definitely owned. Uh, they did not belong to themselves. The only freedoms that they had were whatever freedoms that their masters gave them. Uh, and certainly, they were property. Mm. Um, and so they were treated as such very often. So what's really interesting is as we were, you know, as we were preparing and we're studying and we're doing some research, what I realized is that running away was punishable by death. Correct. And so just, just escaping is you know is is like you've got out right like yeah. good for you but from the tenor of this letter it almost sounds like that doesn't seem to be the point so we'll have to go a little bit deeper but and i think the last thing just to, to give a full picture is um so paul is writing in rome in a roman in rome in jail mm -hmm. and we're saying that we believe that philemon is the head of a church in Colossae. correct now We've done a little math, looked at a couple maps. That is 1,500 miles. Now, I don't know where you are, but I'm just gonna let you know today, as we speak, we are filming in Milford, Connecticut. It is 1,500 miles to Austin, Texas. 
okay, from Milford, Connecticut. I'm assuming that slaves didn't drive, they didn't have horses or anything. So am I to believe that this letter is about a slave that somehow was free, or right, well, ran away to his freedom, found Paul 1,500 miles away, and this is where this this is the background of of where this story and this letter is taking place. So here's the thing that gives me goosebumps thinking about that. Right? We don't know fully all the context, but the few things that we can imagine, right? It's not like right now. I know if I want to go to Austin, Texas, I know I have, uh, let's see, I have Minister Belinda in the area. I've got the Kilas is in the area. I've got the Rollins not too far away. I can shoot him a Facebook note. I can find out where their address were. It was not the same way. So the idea that here he is, if he even knew of Paul, which chances are, it might not have been, and once we get into the story, we'll mm -hmm. kind of get a little bit more. So how is it that 1,500 miles away, he connects with Paul, who happens to be his owner's best friend, right? Because if you look at this, Paul is saying, partner in the ministry. So he goes 1,500 miles away, connects with his owner's best friend, and in this process, finds the message of Jesus Christ that Paul preaches him, gives him, brings him to salvation, and he becomes one of heart with Paul. And I think if I just look at this one little piece, it's how far God will go to save each individual person. No matter how far they've fallen, no matter how bad they've messed up, God will find you even if you're 1,500 miles away in no man's land, whatever the case may be. He still can have a divine appointment for you. And I love this. It's like it's mind-boggling when I think about that. I would definitely, with that in mind, I would also encourage you to go back and watch our Jonah series because yes. that, that is very Same. similar, very similar, except you only got to tell Onesimus once. Right. So, but, okay. So, pass the mic. Yeah. Here we go. So, let's get into the text. We are, okay, um, okay, so let's get into the text. We, let's start right here. What is, uh, we see that Paul is saying, well, so I have a, a little bit of a different version. I have the, the ESV, and so it says, uh, accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner, also for Christ Jesus. Yeah. Why? Why not just make him do it? Like, if you have the juice, right? Like, like I feel like the way I grew up, right? Sports teams, captains, all this stuff, coaches. You've waited your whole life to be the man. Like, I, I just want to be the man, and then I just never want to say anything twice. I mean, it's the worst part of my parenting. Yeah. Is the, well, because I said so, yeah. right? So, why? Why is it that you think that Paul does not come with the authority that he has and chooses to address him, chooses to elevate him first and then yeah. to address him. So let's, let's expand this out and okay. bring it back in. So what we see Paul is doing is he's saying, Philemon, I've got, this, I, I've got your slave. Onesimus is with me. And I'm going to be sending him back to you. And I'm asking you to receive him back as a brother um, and I'm asking you even bigger. We'll talk about what the ask is in a moment. Um, but you have to remember, like, the, the point of it is, is you see right from the get-go, like we said at the beginning, right? He writes this not as apostle, right? right? So when he's addressing Philemon, he's not addressing Philemon as, I'm your boss. Right. He uses very specific language. Matter of fact, if we back up, and we back up to verse 6. He says, I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding. Uh, then he comes down, if I skip back down a little bit further to verse 14. Um, actually, I'll back up. I'll say I'm in verse 12. Um, I'm sending him, this is Onesimus, who is my very heart back to you. I would like to have kept him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in change for the gospel, but I did not want to do anything without your consent. Let me drop it down again to verse 17. He said, so if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. So I think the first answer to your question is this. You're asking, why didn't he just say, do this? Right. And I think there's a couple of things happening. Number one, Paul was trying to teach Philemon 
that we have this responsibility as believers. Um, everybody just wants, tell me the law, tell me what I have to do, and I'll do it, right? Absolutely. But that was the problem with the Jews. They were given the law because the law was supposed to point them towards dependence on God because they could never fully fulfill the law. But Paul comes back, Jesus comes and says, I've now come and fulfilled that law. And they say, what is the greatest law now? It is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, mind, and being, and love your neighbor as yourself. Paul then reinforces this all through Ephesians, all through Galatians and, and everywhere else, but very specifically in Galatians, by the way. And he says, listen, you're still asking for law to follow, mm. and that law is not going to do it for you. I'm asking you, I'm wanting you to be led by the law of love, which he explains is he wanting to be led by the Holy Spirit. So if he came in and said, Philemon, here's what I want you to do. You're to do this. You're to let go of your slave, right? And to do this. Now Philemon is now torn between what do I want to do? What does Paul want to do? This is Paul's opinion, whatever I want to do. Versus Paul was saying, I'm not interested in you deciding whether you agree with my opinion. I want you to wrestle with this one, with the love, but by, with, with the Lord. But by the way, he also looks at this and said, I'm also not doing it because we're partners. So the reason I read those scriptures is because they're partner language. Mm. Paul says, hey, listen, I recognize this is your slave. I see who he is to me, but he's still your slave. Mm. And because we're partners, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to give you the opportunity to make a decision yourself to honor God. See, what I love now with that lens, you're able to look now at verse 9. And verse 9 looks very different now, right? Because now he says, I prefer to appeal to you, yeah. right? So now, wait, so you're asking, almost begging? And not only that, Paul, Paul goes beyond that. He doesn't say, I'm asking, and by the way, I'm six foot four, 250 pounds. Paul says, I'm an old man who's yeah. in chains. Yeah. Paul has never been more vulnerable. Right? There's, there's nothing Paul can really do at this point. There's no defense he can. And so I think that I really, it, it says something about leadership to be able to lead on the appropriate level. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> so I think that's the beautiful thing, right? So we see Paul who arguably, right, maybe he and Peter could go back and forth of who's the chief of the apostles, <laughs> right? You know, um, but arguably he's a man of great authority, greatly respected, but you're absolutely right. He does not come in from a one-up position telling Philemon what he needs to do to get up. He comes and he comes down to Philemon's level and he says, hey, listen, mm. we're brothers in this. Wow. And here's how I want to encourage you. But let me go back and make this point to you. How does he set it up? If you look at it, what has he said? <laughs> going back there in verse four, remember what he said? Or verse five, he said, because I hear about your love, remember we talked about right. that? Yeah. that sacrificial, overwhelming love, that, that giving love. Um, he re turns around again in verse seven, he says, and your love has given me great joy and encouragement uh, because you refresh the heart of the people. Therefore, I could be bold and order you what to do, but I make this appeal to you based on the basis of love. What is he saying? I'm making this appeal to you because I know the nature of who you are and I know you how you have treated the other saints, the other Christians, mm. and now I'm asking you, based on who I know you to be, to expand your thinking, open your heart, and go even deeper than you think is possible. Mm. Mm. And I'm coming to you, not in the place of power ordering, but I'm coming as an old man. I'm coming and saying, I want, I imagine Paul was not saying, do this for me. Right. He was saying, I imagine Paul looking going, is my son in the faith, even though he's been calling a brother, right. is my son in the faith really going to get this next level learning? Mm. Well, I'll tell you what, he doesn't make it any easier for him. No. He, he immediately turns around in the next the next part and tells him that Onesimus, yeah. he's my child. He's become my child. Yes. Now, I think this would be a good time before we get to verse 11, because I love that. That's one of my favorite verses in the whole thing. Is that um, Onesimus. Mm -hmm. This is not 
this is this is one of those times where you do the Bible study, where you, you check out what names mean and stuff. And Paul was so clever that he actually puts it in there uh, for us on some of yours on the bottom of your pages. There might be a note or something. But uh, Onesimus actually means useful. Yes. Now uh, there's there's a there's a, a a line of thinking that says that it was probably a nickname given to him. He probably wasn't his given name, but that it was a nickname given to what he was when he was there. That he was a Mr. Fix-It, that he was able to do this and able to do that. Paul, after claiming Onesimus as his own, says, well, formerly, Mr. Useful, we'll call him, was useless to you. But now he is indeed useful to you and to me. Yeah. See, what I love is that Paul is not just taking Philemon and saying, come here, man. But he's putting himself in the middle. Yeah. And he's taking Onesimus with this hand and he goes, I know right now what you see is you see property. I know right now what you see is loss. I know right now what you see is somebody who ran away. But I want to show you what I see. Yeah. I see useful in a new way. Yeah. Right now, because he's useful now to me and to you. And I think that's the interesting thing, right? Because he has not, I mean, Onesimus clearly is now back. Right. We're, we're seeing this letter. But, yes. but, but Paul, when Paul's writing the letter, he's writing the letter to Philemon saying he's useful to me and to you. But Philemon doesn't know he's useful to him. He, he's thought of him as Mr. Useless, right? And right. I love that's actually an N.T. Wright. The, the theologian N.T. Wright uh, actually puts that language in his uh, version of, of the New Testament. Um, but I think the interesting thing is that Paul is looking down the road and he's saying he's useful to me and I know that because he's here with me, but he's useful to you because I know Philemon where you need to go mm. and I know your next level of ministry and you don't know this, but Onesimus is useful to you because without the next decision that you make, you'll never get to the next thing that God has called you to be. And I think that's the way it is with us, right? It's the same thing with the Jesus at the table, right? He looks and he washes his disciples' feet, knowing they're all gonna betray him. Even Judas washes their feet, not because they've done something so spectacular, but because he knows who they're going to be and he knows what they're going mm -hmm. to do. And so we see Paul writing this letter to Philemon about Onesimus, not because of what Onesimus has done in the past, what he's doing in the moment, but what he knows Onesimus' uh, importance is to their, by the way, their strategic partnership in the future. Mm. See, I love it because it's so easy. It's so easy, like you said, to read it through quick and go, oh, oh, maybe he needs a tire fixed, or maybe <laughs> he needs, like, no, this, this isn't about bales of hay. This right. is so much deeper. So love it, absolutely, absolutely love it. And again, I, I think that Paul, with the with the wordplay, I think is absolutely incredible. So now, we see where he says, uh, "I'm sending him back to you, sending my very mm. heart, sending my very heart." Now, isn't it funny that the first time, if Paul doesn't have the authority that Paul has, Paul can't can't use. His relationship to identify Onesimus in a different way, yeah. right? So this whole time we've been talking about how he's he's so relatable, he's so yeah. personable, he's so down to earth. But only Paul can say yeah. that this is my heart. Yeah, you know, there's there's always that 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 um, unique place I think in relationships where when you're in a relationship there is kind of a even when you're equal there is kind of a there's one who's a little more the alpha one who can you know so Paul defines. The relationship he has now with Onesimus. And what I love about it is, well, if you know Paul's heart, then you know Onesimus. Right. And it's really becoming more of, of this, not my plea or my, let me get you to do what I want you to do. This is more of a, let me, I just want you to see what I, what I see, man. And can you see it? And, and so I think the interesting thing here <laughs> is this. We see a man who was a slave and he's running from his master, which by the way, we don't fully know why he ran from his master, right? An argument could be made with Philemon that he's created an environment whereby his slave feels threatened, feels insecure, whatever the case may be. Um, it's interesting because we see here, maybe we'll get to it in just a moment, we see that he didn't just run away. There's more to it than mm -hmm. him just running away. 
But if we think about that and we think about Onesimus in his identity when he reaches Paul, we imagine when Paul says, he who is my heart, what we see is not Paul saying, this is a good guy. Hey, you know, he's not saying, hey, Philemon, you know what? I've been hanging around with Onesimus. You know, he's a really good guy. You've had him as a slave and you've, you've really missed out that he was a really good guy. What he says is this. He says, I'm said, I would like to keep him with me because I, he's, he's my heart. He said, I'd like to keep him with me. He said, but number one, I'm not going to because it's your job to release him whether you can. But he's saying, he's taken on the identity that I have taken on. Mm. And what is the identity that Paul's taken on? You'll find it all through his scripture. He talks about finding his new identity in Christ. His heart is found in Christ. And he's saying, Philemon, I'm sending him back to you. He's got my very heart. What is Paul's heart? The heart to spread the gospel to hmm. all people. And he said, Philemon, Onesimus is coming back to you, but he's coming back with the same heart that I have. And by the way, do you remember what language Paul's using? Partnership? That's right. If this is Paul's heart, then it's Philemon's heart, which means he's now going to have to have a major shift of thinking hmm. by receiving Onesimus back. Um, so, so there's that verse 13 though, he goes a little further and he talks just really quickly. I love how he says, you know, um, I, I would have liked to have kept him to, I would like to keep him with me so that he could take your place. Meaning Philemon, he's saying, Hey, Philemon, you really should be with me here in my chains. Here I am in prison. You should kind of be here taking care of me because we're partners but you have an important place there. Boy, I'd really like to keep Onesimus here because he's actually doing your job. But even though, get this, even though I need him, even though he's extremely useful to me, even though I see that he has a heart for God, he's still your slave. And I'm sending him back to you. Mm. And, and it's interesting, just on a, a side note, I'd love to have him keep your place uh, helping me. He says, helping me. It's actually the word there would be diakonos. That's right. So it would actually, he's here ministering with me. So diakonos would be the word deacon or, yep. or we use as a minister here. So Paul's actually saying, hey, he's actually acting as a minister in chains with me, but he is your slave. So I'm sending him back to you because I'm not taking away his position as your slave because that's only your that's job right. to do. Hmm. Now, My goodness. Now that can tweak some people. Well, it's funny because he goes right to uh, if we go that goes right in the fourteen. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion. Well, see, this is the funny part, right? So why I had asked initially, hey, you got the juice? Why not just you know? Yeah. Well, but some of that is you know. I don't know if you're, I'm sure you remember this, but years and years ago, I mean, I was just coming up and we had had conversations about, you know, at this point, all the, all the political hot topics of the, the 90s and early 2000s, right? Uh, you know, I, I'm 17, I'm just learning how to vote. You know, what do I vote for? Who do I vote for? I don't want to make Jesus mad, right? <laughs> and so, uh, and, uh, and we're talking about this, that, and how, how do you legalize this? How do you not legalize that? You know, whatever the case is. And I remember you had told me very simply, you can't legalize morality. You, yeah. Like at the end you of the day, cannot legislate morality you, in an immoral society. You just can't. And so, with that in mind, we look at this and we say, "Well, goodness." In 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 the original context, in the re original Greek here, it actually means generosity. Yes. Well, you can't be generous if I make you be generous. The only way you can go above and beyond is that you've chosen to go above and beyond. If you owe a hundred dollars in taxes and you give them, you give the IRS a hundred dollars, you've not been generous. You've paid your bill. Right. If you owe a hundred dollars in taxes and you go, you know what? I want to cover these taxes too. Doesn't even have to know about it. That's where generosity is. Generosity is in this place. And Paul was so wise to use almost every verse here from that we're going through from eight to twenty-two. Almost everyone is a principle that he is teaching. So to uh, Philemon, and by the way, that Onesimus is is learning by proxy. Yes. So I just I, I always that really really uh, stuck out to me is this idea that you cannot make generosity mandatory because there's no longer generosity. Right. If you're forced 
to make the right decision, you haven't made the right decision, you've just done what was expected of you. Mm. But when the option is there and you choose it, right? It's the whole thing of love. You know, well, right. why, why doesn't God just, you know, why does God allow evil to happen? Well, without evil, there's no opportunity to choose for good. Without, you know, why, why did God put, you know, allow the, the tree to be in the garden? Well, because how could, if, how could Adam and Eve choose love if they never had any choice but to do the right thing. God didn't create robots. That wasn't that's the right. point. And that's what Paul's getting across. He's saying, yes, he's saying, listen, I could, I could, I could order you to do this. And, and, you pro and, and the, the implication is, and if I did, I know you would do what I'm asking you to do. But I'm not asking you to do it for my sake. I'm asking you to do it for not Onesimus' sake. I'm asking you to do this <laughs> For your sake, he missed the Miyagi him. He yoded him. Absolutely. You know, let's because we're we're gonna be running down. I I, I want to jump into this if if we can just actually kind of go a little further. Um, let's read through. Um, I did not want to do anything. For, okay, let's jump down. Okay, so verse 15, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a while was so that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. Now this is where it gets key. Listen to this. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I might have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. So, <clears throat> here's the interesting thing that we find with Philemon. So, we, we've been talking about this. We, we talked about recognition that Philemon uh, ran away, so that was punishable by death. But there was more going on than that. What else was going on in there, Minister? So it looks as though that uh, he, it looks like he may have taken something. That there is a debt of some sort. So yes. Um, now it goes back even beyond there, right? back to our introduction. Yeah. Is that debt that he took something, uh, stole an item or some some money? Is that debt the reason why he's in slavery in the first place? Right. Is that debt the debt of being gone on this road trip? So we don't know what the debt is, but I can assume it's continuing to mount the fact that he's not there. Right. So here's what I love. When we started this series last week, and I opened up with it today, we talked about small book, big message. Because this is where it starts to come home. We start to see this debt of slavery, and we see it in two ways. So the first thing we see is there is a debt that a slave would be. So a runaway slave is an economic loss to its owner, right? So a slave has a monetary value, both the work that they accomplish, they're losing out on, plus the, the value that they had. They bought these slaves or however they were, so they were out that. But it's very clear in here, the way it's written, that Onesimus must have stolen something on the way out the door as well. Paul's now sending him back and he's saying this. He's saying, listen, whatever it is that he owes you, what does he say? I write this with my own hand. Um, he, 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 he repeats himself, right? And anytime you see a principle repeated, it's, it's something that you need to clue in on because the writer is emphasizing it. Right. And Paul is emphasizing this to, to Philemon. He's saying, if he has done you any wrong, Number one, or if he owes you anything, charge it to me. I'm Paul, and I'm writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. Now, that's a very interesting statement to put in there. What do you think about that? Well, it's that? funny, right? Because you can read that, and this, this, is, this is a fun exercise with Bible, biblical translation. Right. right? So yours says not to mention. Now, when I hear not to mention, I think, okay, Paul, that's kind of slick. You, you, you kind of threw a jab on the way out. Okay, well, not to mention, you owe me, right? Mine says a little bit different. It says, to say nothing of you owing me, even your own self. There seems to be a debt here yes. that's implied. And this is, this, is the beauty of, this is the beauty of the authenticity of this letter, yeah. right? Because 
we don't know all of it, but I think we can, I think we can infer. Yeah. So I think there's a couple of things we see in this. Number mm-hmm. one is this. Some people have thought, and, and to be honest with you, I'll be honest with you. All right. True confessions. I've read Philemon before and I've read that scripture before. I can't tell you. I've studied Philemon and I always read it. I was like, man, Paul, you are a snarky little son of a gun. You know, over in Galatians, <laughs> he, he writes some pretty tough words to what are called the Judaizers. And um, he has he some choice. He was a much younger man. He was a much younger than man in ministry. And he, he, he tells them that, you know, they should, um, uh, he, they should castrate themselves if they want to follow the law. So that's the kind of the way. But you see in this letter, something's different. And if you read it as snarky, if you read it as him saying, hey, and by the way, don't forget, you owe me your life, it now becomes this sarcastic little manipulation. But if you interpret it that way, then you miss the whole point of everything Paul's been saying up to That's this right. point. That's right. What Paul has been doing is he's trying to impress this lesson on Philemon. And I imagine Paul now, he's coming towards the end of his ministry, and he's looking and, 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 and he's saying, I'm, I want to know that, that my, my, my sons are getting it, that they're getting it. And he says, um, by the way, he says, I want you to remember, not to mention that you owe me your very self or that, that, that what does it say in the ESV? It says, to say nothing of you, of your owning, uh, you owing me even your own self. Yep. And what is he doing? What he's actually doing is saying, hey, don't forget Philemon, there was a time before you met me when you were a slave. But you were a slave to sin. Mm. You were a slave to that thing which bound you. But when I came to you and I brought you the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ set you free. And you're free to the extent that now you are refreshing the hearts of the saints with your giving generosity. But I'm telling you, there's still a piece of you that you're holding back. And now this is your opportunity because you have a slave. Paul doesn't come in and say, get rid of all your slaves. He says, open your heart to love a slave that you, a man you've seen as a slave, number one, and number two, who's stolen from you and receive him back as a brother. But here's the phenomenal thing about this. The price that Philemon would have to pay to do this is enormous because Philemon now has to look at the overturning of his own household because if he brings Onesimus back, having been a thief and a runaway, and he forgives him, but it's more than forgiving him. He doesn't just say, okay, your debt is paid, get back to work. What does Paul say, Philemon? I'm asking you to take him back as if it's me. That's what he's, those are his literal words. I want you to receive him as you would receive me, one who is my heart, as a brother. And, and so now he's saying this to a slave. What are all the rest of the slaves going to think? Right. He loses now. Do they? What happens? And so what he's saying is, I'm wanting you to understand. Paul says in um, Galatians 3, uh, I think it's Galatians 3.18 or somewhere around there. He says, uh, for in Christ Jesus, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, uh, a male nor female, slave or free man. For we are all one in Christ. And Paul is saying, Philemon, you have now cared for the Christians around you. And you have done so with incredible generosity. But now I'm also asking you to look at one who was not a Christian to you, but is now coming back. And will you receive him back, not based on what he did to you on the past, wow. but based on who he is now through the work of the cross. And as I am in partnership with you, Philemon, I've now brought Onesimus into partnership with me, and I'm asking you to receive him as a partner, equal partner and brother in Christ. What he's asking Philemon to do is see this runaway thieving sleeve, thieving slave slave (laughs) as a brother. And the (laughs) only way that can happen is to wrestle with the gospel and say, if the cross can do it for me, can it also do it for him? And this is the wisdom of Paul. This is the wisdom of, I think it's so easy to sit back and think, you know, I did. 
well, why didn't you just say abolish slavery? Right. And what Paul is saying, but then what? But then what? So we abolish slavery, but, but then what? What Paul is saying here is, oh, I absolutely plan to abolish slavery, but to bring them where? Right. Because I can't put my brother as my slave. I can't put my sister as my slave. And so I think that what's what's really interesting is this is it's this idea of it's almost like if we're in the family of God, it's almost like a spiritual nepotism. Yeah. I right? like that. Yeah. We're like it, it's okay to be nep it's okay to favor your brother in the faith. But also remember, this is not Paul saying this is not Paul saying the 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 uh he he we debated about it and he proved to me. This is Paul saying, I've watched him. Yes. As an old man in chains when he could have let me down, when he could have stole from me, I watched him. He came out here 1500 miles, saw maybe a familiar face, maybe didn't, realized I knew you didn't keep running and stayed. I've watched him. Yeah. You knew him one way and I'm telling you, I didn't do it, but I was here to watch it. And so I think it's so so incredible. You know, it's, it, it always it goes back to the to the verse in John, right, where no greater love than for a friend than to let to, to lay uh, his life down for a friend. Right. And so often we think that, OK, well, yeah, I'll die for you. No problem. But I love the way that you break that down. When you, you talk about Jesus dies for the opportunity of friendship. Yes. Jesus dies so that one day you can realize what he did and you can jump into it. This is what we're saying. So, Paul, I almost believe that what Paul is saying is if the rest of your slaves get saved just so they can be free like Onesimus, I don't care what their motive is because let God deal with their yeah. heart. Let God see if it's real. Now, listen, I want to take us as we come to a close in this. <clears throat> I want to spin this into another little direction. So it's interesting. We started out talking last week. and We said it's, it's fascinating how there's really two uh, protagonists or right. protagonists in this. There's Paul and there's Philemon. But Philemon has the opportunity to be the pro protagonist or antagonist. But we actually see a third in here, which is now Onesimus. Because everything has been written from the context of Paul talking to Philemon about Onesimus. But I want us to put us ourselves into Onesimus' shoes for just a that. moment. So if we think about it, uh, it's very likely that in the day, Philemon, if, or uh, Onesimus, if he was grown up as a slave, been a slave, didn't read um, uh, and didn't write. Um, so he might not have been educated. Uh, if, if, if Philemon looks at him, ironically, his name is Mr. Useful, but Paul, Paul is saying, hey, listen, Philemon, you've looked at him as being useless. That also says something, right? Mm -hmm. So if Philemon looks at him as, hey, this useless slave, that would probably be a good reason why maybe Mr. Useless That's took good. off and That's became good. Mr. Useful and came back. But I want you to imagine for a moment, here Onesimus is, He's finally found his new identity. He's found his identity in Christ no longer as a slave. And Paul says, listen, Onesimus, if you truly trust me, if you truly love me, I'm sending you back to your master. Now, I'm going to give you a letter to take back. Now, in those days, Onesimus, whether he could read or not, it would have been highly offensive if Onesimus had read that letter. So can you imagine the 1,500 mile journey back to the slave owner who had called him useless, the slave owner who he had probably stolen from, and he's now going back. Imagine the journey that he had to take going back, knowing full well, by the way, if you read Paul's writings, he gives, he gives writings to slaves. He says, slaves, obey your masters. That's right. Ephesians, yep. And I imagine the conversation that Paul may have had with Onesimus saying, Paul, Onesimus, you may go back as a slave and you may be a slave for the rest of your life, but be a slave for Jesus Christ. Just like I'm in chains for Christ, you live in chains for Christ and so demonstrate the excellence of God's love that everyone sees it. And I imagine that journey going all the way back there. And I imagine Onesimus standing there as Philemon is reading this letter from Paul, not knowing maybe what Paul's asking. 
and wondering, am I going to come back as a slave? Not even having the slightest clue what could be written up. Is there even tomorrow? Is he, there with, even a tomorrow? He's within his right to end it. Like, and literally, like the punishment was up to and including crucifixion. Right. So we're not talking little things here. But something happens in Onesimus that he has the courage to go 1,500 miles back and say, if that is the cross that I have to pick up and carry, I will follow Jesus. When Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you must pick up your cross. In Hebrews, it said, Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the shame of the cross, right? And so I imagine Onesimus going, it was so real to him. I'm going back to slavery, but I'm doing it for Jesus. And I'm leaving it in his hands. And now Philemon has to take this man back and look at him and say, will I see him through the eyes of his shame? Or will I see him through the eyes of a brother in Christ? And Paul, there's this one last scripture that I want to address because it's important. It could be looked over so quickly. But in verse 22, Paul says, Oh, and one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answers to your prayer. Now, in the, in the, in the Eastern tradition, in the Middle Eastern culture, man, when a guest came to your house, you treated them as well or better than family. So Paul is saying, Philemon, get that guest house ready because when I come back to you, I'm looking to celebrate with you. But what's the power of it? How is he asking Philemon to receive Onesimus back? As, as me. As himself. It is just the same as him saying, Philemon, get that guest house, that guest room ready for Onesimus, who is me. Mm. You know, and I think this is the power of this book. It's so simple, it's so short, and so packed full. And I think I, I look at it and I wonder, you know, there was two things that had to happen. There was two bills that were paid in essence. You know, I like to imagine it this way. If you can imagine getting, uh, maybe you had a big fine. Let's say, let's say you got, you got a, um, a speeding ticket or something. And it, whatever the fine was, it was just... It, it, was, it was beyond your ability to pay, right? So often we've looked at Christianity as, hey, when I come to Jesus, he pays my bill. Thank you, Jesus. And so there we go. I have a bill that says Mike Bulkley, uh, $4,000 speeding ticket. Yes, I would have had to go in really fast. Um, and, uh, but you say it's paid for, right? But that's not how it works. Because see, that still points out as me being the one who messed up and somebody else had to fix it for me. But the power of the gospel is this. When we understand repentance, we come to Jesus Christ. He takes that bill that we owe, the shame of it, the, 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 the embarrassment of it, the fear of it, and he erases our name from it. Hmm. And so now it does indeed say paid, but our name isn't even on there. It says Jesus Christ because he takes it off. The Bible says in... in, in, in um, uh, Hebrews 10, I think it's around 10, 18, somewhere right around there, that he not only forgives our sins, but he chooses to remember them no more. And I think so often we're in this position where we think of ourselves through the lens of what we've done. For some of us, it's a long journey. Some of us, uh, we're, we're still feeling like Mr. Useless. And we're trying to do everything we can to become useful. But the only thing that makes you useful is when you realize it's Jesus Christ who forgives you of your mess from the past. There's nothing you can do to change the past, but Jesus can do everything to cleanse it. And he's the one who can change you from feeling like Mr. Useless to Mr. Useful. And by the way, it's not just useful to cleaning the house, but rather it's bigger than that. That he's calling you back into partnership, not just with him, Jesus Christ, but he's calling you into partnership, into fellowship in the body of Christ. And you belong. And some of you have been out there feeling useless because you feel like you haven't measured up. Do you see what Paul did here? He didn't go and say, Philemon, Onesimus, come up to my level. He says he came down to their level and he related to them as a brother. And in the same way, Jesus isn't up there with his crossed arms waiting for you to measure up. He comes down and meets you right where you are, even when you feel bound up and chained up. And he says, I've come to give you hope, I've come to give you freedom, and I've come to give you a new future. 
But man, you got to choose it. Um, and, uh, and that's the hope. That is the gospel message in Philemon. One small book with one huge message. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So that wraps up book number one in our <laughs> small books, big news uh, series. And guys, I, I certainly hope you guys enjoyed it. I mean, I, I, I had a ball studying and, and presenting. Um, I mean, it's there for a reason. I mean, right? I mean, yeah. I mean it, we do. You had a conversation with somebody this week, uh, to to the effect of, well, of all the things that can get, get put into the Bible, how do these one page oh, yeah. documents, yeah. right? And just like, yeah, yeah, I exactly. Mean, <laughs> right? Yeah, it must have been important. It so, had to have been important if it was included. <laughs> so. We're going to just make a, a transition. I, I've gotten some questions, and we're, we're going to answer those in just a minute. So, Dave Longard, I have yours. Betty, I have yours. God's Woman, I have yours. Uh, so, we are going to get to those questions in just a minute, so don't go anywhere. Um, but before before we do that, we do want to just, uh, again, uh, I, I certainly, our, our hope and our prayer is really that you're, you're enjoying this, that you're getting something from this. And hopefully, even, you're going back and you're studying. You're not just taking our word for it, but go and go deeper in your own studies. Just because we're done with this book doesn't mean you have to be. Um, but I do want to I do want to give you some announcements, some things we have go, uh, coming forward. Uh, first and foremost, we do want to give you the opportunity to give. Uh, please, you know, if this has benefited you, uh, if we've benefited you at all as a church, this is a great time to give. Um, and so if you can do that, we would, we would be just grateful and, and appreciative of that. Uh, you can use the link that is on the, uh, the bottom of the screen on Facebook and the link that is above on the tab on our website. You can click on that link. You can, uh, again, you can do, uh, you can give, you can set it up that it can be reoccurring, but you can go through all that stuff. But please, uh, if, if you so, if you can, if you so choose, mm. please consider uh, giving and donating. Uh, next, uh, some of our announcements. We do want to announce that I truly hope for families out there and moms and dads, I truly hope that you guys are enjoying our Kingdom Kids online services. So those are live at 9.30 a.m. on uh, Sunday, Sunday mornings. So I really hope you guys are getting something out of it. We'd love to hear your feedback. Um, about those videos and and how how the discussion questions are going and and uh, and, and again just whatever your feedback is. Uh, also, if you've not gotten if you if you don't get to make it live at 9:30, that's okay. Uh, all of them are still up on YouTube as well as on our Facebook page. Next, we do want to invite you as always to our Sunday morning service that is at 10 o'clock. Uh, 10 o'clock Sunday morning. So, of course, please uh, be a part of that. You can tune right in right here, as well as wherever you're watching here, as well as we, we also uh, host on um, YouTube as well. We do have every Tuesday night, we have our prayer night. Uh, so, obviously, that was last night, but you are more than welcome to go back and to replay it. Please don't think because you've missed something, you've missed it. This is the beauty of technology. You are included even when it's expired. Right? There's still time and a, and a, and a, and a, and a, uh, for you to be a part of that, so please consider doing that. As well, our 24-hour prayer initiative, you can go onto our website and you can sign up for a 30-minute slot. And we're just looking and hoping and believing that uh, at, at any moment of the day, we have somebody that has teamed up with us, that has partnered uh, yeah. with us to come and to pray. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind doing that, checking that out. And then lastly, it is Wednesday night. So that does mean that uh, down that we are filming our and um, our youth, uh, our youth service. So that's not just for our youth, but if you're a parent of the youth, uh, we invite you to tune in and to be a part of that. So again, you may have been here and you may have just heard that, oh my goodness, I didn't know you had anything. Again, the replays will be available on their Facebook page. So you can go to their Facebook page, Elevate Youth Ministry, uh, and then you can go back and you can replay that. We want you to be connected with everything. With that being said, we are going to close with prayer and then we're going to get to the questions. So uh, I can close with prayer go ahead. and yeah. then we'll go to the questions. Father, we thank you so much father we thank you that uh man we thank you for your word we don't care how concentrated it is we don't care how efficient it is god we just so thankful that it's always effective mm. so god we just pray that this word speaks and continues to speak that this letter that was written for one has a message for us all 
God, we thank you for this word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that reveals it. And we thank you for Christ who makes it true. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Pastor Mike, we have a yes. few questions here. Great. Um, so we question number one. Mr. Wangard asks, what tells us that Onesimus ran away? He, he says, I've always assumed that Philemon uh, had loaned Onesimus to Paul. Great question, Dave. Um, so it's interesting. In the scripture, there's there's some sense of indication, um, but the bigger the bigger reason is if you look at the church historians, uh, most of the church historians and most all the commentary writers have all agreed, uh, pretty much across the board, that uh, uh, that he had been a runaway and also had stolen something uh, on the way. So the assumption is made uh, very often from just look and say, okay, what has been written down in history um, uh, for it. Ironically, an interesting point is that if you look at uh, some of the church fathers, I forgot exactly if it was Irenaeus uh, or Irenaeus, um, they identified that it's very possible that um, Onesimus ended up becoming the bishop of Ephesus after Timothy. There is a, um, there is a strain of thinking that, that, is, that is very prevalent. A very, very prevalent strain of thinking. So the answer to your question, that is it. From reading uh, ch church historians and commentaries uh, is the biggest, and it does not violate that, that interpretation doesn't violate. Actually, interestingly, um, there's two things that we see that we didn't really get a chance to talk about yep. is the, the the forgiveness of Philemon uh, was too far. The forgiveness of, ne of Onesimus was twofold. First of all, it was the recognition of um, letting go of his debt as a slave, forgiving the slave debt, meaning you are a slave, so the identity as a slave, but also forgiving the identity of as a thief. That's right. And so there's this recognition. So if you look at it from the gospel perspective, there's this understanding that God forgives us uh, and God restores us not only from our sin condition that we were born with, that we were identified with from birth, but he also forgives us of the sins that we commit. So it's a twofold uh, forgiveness. Dave, I hope that answers your question. Um, certainly feel free. We have plenty of time to come back. Betty asks, uh, Paul mentioned that Philemon owed him himself. What did he owe him? Philemon. So, if you understand what Philemon, what Paul was saying to Philemon, is, and I kind of alluded to this, Paul was saying to Philemon, Philemon, remember something. Before you met me, before I met you, Philemon, you were a slave to sin. Is essentially what he was saying. Philemon, you were a slave to sin. That was the point he was trying to get across to, to him. And if you're a slave to sin, then we know that you are a slave to death, that you have one eternal outcome, which is eternal separation from Jesus Christ. And so what Paul was saying is, Philemon, don't forget, before you knew me, uh, you know, you were hopeless, but I came and I brought you hope and I brought you life and I made you a partner in the gospel with me. And, and again, that word partner, I, I, we, we talked about this a little bit last week. The word partner for them wasn't a 50-50 business proposition. This was a covenantal word. We are one. This isn't like, hey, if it works out, it works out. This was Paul saying, we are brothers. We are bound together as blood, right? And so what Paul was saying before that, you were bound to sin. But now because of the message I brought you, Philemon, you're now bound to Jesus Christ and bound to me, and you're thus bound to life. And I'm reminding you of that because now you have the opportunity to bring that same life to your brother, Onesimus. Great question, Betty. Well, I love it because I, we had talked about this earlier, right? The, the, the whole idea is that we're not just free from, we're free to. To. You know, and, and that's always really stuck with me. It's this idea that we think that freedom is being able to just, you know, I'm free from rules. So I can do whatever I want. I'm free. I don't know. We're free too, right? Paul says that uh, in Romans, he talks about how uh, we were all slaves to sin. Yeah. But then he says that there's this ever, there's this ever present debt that we have. Yes. And it's to love one another. To love and one so another. it's just so beautiful. Oh, no man, anything but the debt to love one another. Exactly. And so I think that that, that perfectly encapsulates uh, who who Philemon is. Yeah. Um, well, good. No, I, I like a, okay. I'm going to write a note for myself so if I don't get to it, I will remember. We have God's woman. She is asking, do you think that Paul is sweet-talking Philemon's heart so that he wouldn't punish Onesimus? Um, no. I, I, I mean, I think we kind of talked about this. Um, I think we talked about this uh, or a little bit earlier, um, sorry, I got distracted by something 
was he sweet talking his heart? No, I think what he was saying was, hey, listen, I'm, I'm laying it out for you very plainly. Um, and I'm wanting you. I, I think it wasn't a matter of sweet talking. That kind of goes back again into the sense of manipulation. If Paul was trying to manipulate Philemon, it would have undercut the whole case that he was making. Mm. He was trying to say, Philemon, I'm laying a case out for you. You're a good man. You have proven your love for the brothers of Christ around you. You've proven to refresh their hearts. What I'm asking you to do now is, are you ready to go all the way and are you willing to receive this sinner back and not just restore him back to a, a place of employment, but actually to something even better? He even uses that word. I'm asking that you write that you would do even more than I would ask and that you would receive him as a brother, bring him to the level of equality with you. Um, so if he was sweet talking him, I think the point that would have been a manipulation. Um, and clearly that was not the, you know, clearly that was not the case going on here. Now, what does that say? In God's woman, I am with you. Okay, because that's, again, we've read it, we've talked about this for a while. So that was certainly a question that I had. I had read it the first time as Lee, not as Paul. So when I read it, his lead was full of sarcasm and dripping with manipulation. Just, hey, that's what worked. What does it say, though, how uncomfortable it is for us to just encourage one another? Mm. What does it say that even us on the outside looking in, well, the only reason he's doing this, he's setting him up for the big ask. Yeah. Right? Like, this is what you do. You butter him up, you butter him up, you butter him up. Oh, and here's what I wanted. And like... When's the last time that we intentionally encouraged and spoke about someone what we've heard in the positive? Okay, so this is another really good point, right? If I'm manipulating, right? If I'm sweet talking somebody, what is the point? It's selfish. It's, it's about I, me. It's, something it's I'm, about what I'm going to I'm get. I'm playing my of cards to, for to my get reward. what I want, right? What does Paul note about Philemon? That he's Paul, selfless. You are, Philemon, you're a selfless guy. I'm giving you another opportunity to up your selflessness game. And so, so that's what's going on here. And so Paul's not looking, going, hey, listen, I'm looking at you do this on my behalf. Paul's saying, Philemon, I want you to do this on your behalf. If you restore, what, if you bring Onesimus, Onesimus alongside as your brother, you're actually going to find out you're going to benefit from this. If you do this for him, you're going to benefit from this as much as Onesimus will, you will, and even more, because you'll have gained a partner in the, in the, in the ministry. What I hear you saying, though, and this is, this again, this is the wisdom. The wisdom of Paul is that he's giving him, he's only testing him on what he already knows to be true. Yes. So it's not a setup. Correct. Philemon, be you. Right. Don't let this scenario take you Great from point. you. Just Great be point. you. If you can be you, and if you can receive him yep. as how I see him now, be you. Don't yep. lose yeah, yeah, yeah. you. Just be you. And if you can do that, I'm telling you, we all benefit from it. Yeah. What a great point. So I'm just really excited. I, I got to read this last one. Joe and Nilsa, I am so happy to see that you guys were watching. I'm so happy to read this comment. But they said uh, that when I read this earlier today, so you definitely get the gold star because you studied, so uh -huh. that's good. But when I read this earlier today, I summed it up to be about choice. But I love that it's about hope. Thank you and great word. Guys, we really appreciate that. And, and the beautiful part of all of that is it's about all of it. Yeah. Right? It's about choice. It's about hope. It's about read this six months from now and see what it's about. It doesn't, it doesn't negate any of the things that we've talked about. It's it's. It's what we're saying it is, but not less. But definitely it can be more. Right. Right? This perspective just changes it all. Yep. Uh, well, you wrote a note. Did you did you get to it? Oh, oh well, I, like he just wrapped it up. I'm like, I don't want to go into another thing. I'm like, you know, I will just say one of the things that you said, and I wish I, I, I just gonna I'm gonna say this because you mentioned this and we didn't we didn't cover it, mm. but you talked about in the beginning you talked about Paul being in the middle and going Philemon mm, on one hand that's right. and putting Onesimus on the other and going Philemon here's your brother he was fallen from you but he's got a place and what does he say you used the word very important word he said. 
reconciliation. Right. Paul talked about the ministry of reconciliation. He says, therefore, we are Christ's ambassadors, be, as if we're making our appeal, be reconciled unto Christ. And what Paul was doing is he's giving a literal lesson. He's saying, uh, Philemon, mm. uh, be reconciled to your brother. Onesimus, be reconciled to your brother. Onesimus, don't look at Philemon as your master. Look at him as a brother. Trust him. That's right. Don't don't look down right. at him and say, That's you better right. take me as... Trust him as a brother. Philemon, receive him as a brother. And that's the ministry of reconciliation. And that is the ministry of the cross. That we who were once in sin were reconciled to Father God through the work of Jesus Christ. So that all of us could be sons and daughters of God and heirs of the promise. And this has been exciting. Thank you so much for joining with us. Go ahead and read up on the book of Jude so you can come prep with your observations and your questions next week. Second to last book. Second to last book in the Bible. All right, don't. Our revelation, we're not going there. Just Jude. Jude. All right. Have a great night, guys. We love you, and we will see you next week.